Welcome to another episode from the Ed Ed. Today I have this really uh, nice, probably 1925 Burroughs Type 5 calculator. And this guy was basically a kind of a head-on competitor to the uh, comptometer uh, calculator. And the comptometer, you know, obviously started out quite a bit earlier. It started, uh, in, I think, 1887 and the uh, the design of this guy, I think the patent date is around 1911, and the initial design that the uh, Burroughs um, folks did, the shell anyways, looked almost exact spinning image of a comptometer, because uh, that was kind of the standard of the day. And the guts themselves are actually quite a bit different, so from a patent uh, claim standpoint, uh, really what... Uh, Comptometer was complaining about is it looked like a comptometer, but otherwise the internals were actually quite a bit different. This particular calculator, uh, it has a, a fascinating history that I'm pretty sure I've pieced together just from evidence that's on the calculator itself. Um, the history of this guy, it looks like I, I kind of have an idea who owned it, and the thing that was kind of neat is looking at the front here you can see a little sticker and if you look at very carefully the lighting is just right you can see the, the sticker says Volco Rope and at first I thought maybe somebody had simply scratched you know their name in here and but I looked at what Volco Rope was about and it's a product by the Gates Rubber Company um, basically V-Belt and so what I thought was, you know, somebody's name scratch in there is actually Gates. So it was probably owned by the Gates Rubber Company in Denver. And on the back side is the really fascinating thing. There are several inspection and maintenance stickers on here. And the sticker, uh, I think the oldest one is from 1972, and then 78, and then 81. So approximately every five years, this thing was given some maintenance all the way up until... Uh, early 80s and presumably if it ran another five years it would have been used clear into the mid 80s so this calculator may have been used by the Gates Rubber Company clear into the uh, mid 80s which is amazingly a long lifespan. The nearest I can gauge this calculator was probably made in 1925 and the Gates Rubber Company it had started around I believe 1911 and it kind of lumped along wasn't you know really getting anywhere until the really early 20s where it finally took off as a business. And so by the time they bought this guy in the mid 20s, their, um, their growth is you know moving along pretty good. And obviously they needed a calculator. And this guy's in pretty good shape. There's, um, there's a crack in its case here. I thought this was stamped sheet metal, but I'm beginning to think looking at this crack, it's probably a, maybe an aluminum casting. Uh, one of the um, little decimal pointers has been broken off. And it's missing a couple of keycaps. And I, when I first got it, I did play with it a little bit, and it was sluggish, but it did work. Some of the columns weren't working too well. And then I played one too many times with it, and it's now kind of stuck, so I'll have to work on that a bit. It's uh, just like the Comptometer direct-driven uh, calculator as far as the energy to operate it is directly from the key presses. And the lever here isn't, um, isn't the um, calculating total key like you would have on a classic adding machine. This is a uh, the clearing mechanism and it'll clear out your, your numbers for, for the next uh, calculation. And uh, just as with all of the other Burroughs uh, calculator products, they need a key to get to into the case of this guy. But luckily it's pretty easy to jimmy this guy. But if you do want a key, I believe uh, Mike at Burroughs.com. I'll have to uh, leave a link in the description but he's been selling these uh, little uh, keys that, I think it's the same key for all these different calculators. It's a fairly straightforward key, but uh, if you want to buy one, I think he might still sell those. I think I can simply jam that in there, get past the hook, and then it lifts. I think it's lifted. And then on this guy, see, can I get all of it up? There we go, there we go. Okay, I got it. But it doesn't want to move any further. So what's my what's the deal here? Oh, that's the other thing. It looks like 
it, uh, on the case, it, it does have a slot, but it doesn't look like it. you can pivot past it easily. But what's nice here is they do have um, some knurled screws on the end here, so I might just be able to take this case completely out. Maybe that's what it's meant to do. Maybe it's not meant to swing. I thought, maybe it thought it was meant to swing, but it's not. The hook is now hooked again. Okay, so great reveal here is okay. So it is a, a um, aluminum casting. Looks like they machined that out to clear the keyboard. There's a number here they milled off a bit. Somebody scratched five 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 in there a couple times. I don't know what five 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 is about. And it has a simple um, solenoid uh, window here. I think it can pop out and clean that celluloid and I think that's it and um, yeah the casting it is a aluminum casting it looks like it's cracked right here which is you know no big deal I think we can live with that little crack otherwise you know of course it's something that's this old and it's been run this long it's looking pretty good so far so on the inside of this guy it looks like it's a planetary kind of a planetary drive and like I say, it's I think it's jammed. Yeah. So uh, probably what I need to do is uh, most likely just lubricate this guy, and it'll probably uh, spring back to life. I don't see anything else particularly uh, jumping out at me. It's pretty clean in there. I mean, it's not too bad. We got some uh, numbers for various castings. I think I don't know if you can see that in the camera or not. Uh, the differences between the mechanism, I can't tell you right offhand the, the immediate difference between the comptometer and the uh, burrows. Other than burrows did go out of their way to make certain that they uh, weren't any sort of patent infringement as far as the internals go. I do know that the burrows is definitely not as uh, advanced as the comptometer. It doesn't have nearly the safety features as far as keeping you from, you know, accidentally not pushing the button all the way down or, you know, clearing numbers quite right and so forth and uh, having made certain that the thing is all you know clear and ready to go it doesn't have quite as many safety features but it costs quite a bit less and um, it was a smaller the later models such as this one the very first one looked just exactly like a comp it was just as deep but you know the the second shell version and this third shell version just looking at um, um, Smithsonian it looks like this was the uh, probably the 1925 model it uh, the first version, like I said, looked like a comptometer. The second version had uh, some uh, pressed little, um, little indents in the sides here for its shell. And then this guy's a little bit simpler um, shell design. So I think what I'll try and do is um, explore lubricating this guy a little bit and see if maybe I can get it to free up. Fortunately, right now everything is very thoroughly locked. Okay, so I've been kind of getting more into using uh, sewing machine oil and then uh, using clock oil maybe for this, some of the smaller mechanisms. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to try and assume that it's mostly at the register section that's the problem and kind of lubricate from there. So I'm going to just lightly put some oil in these various points and see how far we can get on freeing this guy up. Putting too much oil on everybody. Okay, just kind of playing around with this guy. I noticed that if I uh, turn some of these numbers, some numbers further down actually turn also. So obviously some sort of a problem with how the carry is working. It's, it's odd that it's carrying all the way over. So I think that's probably my, oh, this one's really stuck. Okay, so the problem wheels appear to be 
this one here. This one seems very odd, very odd carrying. I'll just bring it up a little bit. Of, well, see who was this guy over here. Okay, so the next thing I've managed to do is uh, free up the, this mechanism a bit by pulling on one of these little, little dog arms and that released a lot of uh, force in the mechanism that had been stored up and I think probably still jammed. Okay, all right, all right. Oh, oh, there we go. I got some motion. Okay, so I'll free up all these guys here. dogs that go on to um, some gear on out uh, it's just outside my field of view there we go yeah it's starting to free up folks a little bit oh yeah quite a bit okay. oh yeah yeah Get some motion here hopefully nobody's been stressed from all that Clear now. No, I cannot clear it. Well, let's do a call it locked. Looks like we got some motion there. This guy is in an odd location. So it looks like this guy is quite badly jammed. This guy seems to be the problem. This one's really quite jammed. Slobber oil here. All these others are free to move. Hold on. This one's in odd off, off, off location. Maybe I'd, actually it might be the guy to the right that's actually causing the trouble. I'm kind of just working it back and forth and slowly loosening things up a bit. Hopefully not stressing anybody. Definitely the problem child right here. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely definitely the problem is right in here, but it's not quite sure who's got the problem. Like all these other little carry mechanisms are moving pretty freely now. Except for these two. I can't tell who is causing the jam.
can quite get this guy to clear. So far, this seems to be getting freer. You notice the um, this gear is on this side, and these two are still stuck over here. So it seems like this guy's, I think, fairly free at this point. I think it's now down to. There's still something. It could be he's not able to move because of this guy. So it seems to be the guy that's the most troublesome guy is this guy so far. I guess once I have something important to report, I'll let you folks know. Okay, so I've made some pretty good progress here. So this mechanism here was pretty jammed right through here. These, uh, I think it was uh, on this side of this frame member, this one and then this one. And constantly working them back and forth, I was starting to get a little more progress. And then oddly enough, what I did is I uh, did a little bit of back motion on the, uh, on the clearing arm. So always the forward motion that I was trying to do and then it seems to have loosened everybody up so now I seem to have motion again it's a little sluggish but it's there okay so I'm not sure where it was jamming at it was it, like I say it's these two wheels and the carrying mechanism it was uh, this would not travel and just kind of gently working things back and forth, adding a little bit of oil. It seemed to slowly loosen things up, and then finally the, the, the thing that finally got it to move was the uh, pulling back a little bit on the clearing, mechanism, clearing arm and not trying to move forward on it. And it finally caused these guys to come loose. So I think the next thing is to just continue kind of generally lubricating everybody and see if I can get reliable operation here. I do know some of these wheels there, they got a crack on them, and one of these nines, it was this nine, is a different nine from the other nines, I've noticed. And if you can see that, this nine is a different style nine than the other nines. So, and this was the wheel that was causing me trouble, so I wonder if at some point in the history of this machine, they had to take it apart and replaced some of the mechanism here, including possibly the, uh, the the number wheel itself, because you can definitely see the number nine is distinctly different from the other nines. Kind of interesting coincidence. I wonder, I wonder what a repair parts kit or a maintenance call was like for these guys back in the day. You know, obviously it wasn't quite as trivial as say, um, you know, sending in your um, radio for repair, I suppose. Something like that, I don't know. Anyhow, looks like we're making some progress here, and I'm, I'm seeing a little bit more how this mechanism works. I should probably read up on the patents and uh, understand the underlying mechanism a bit more. Okay, so a lot of fiddling around, and it looks like uh, we're freed up pretty nicely now. I'm pretty happy with the, uh, the mechanism. And I could maybe do a little more tweaking, but I think it's pretty nice for demonstration purposes. And I think the next thing is I'm missing a couple of these keycaps here. So I printed just some little crude um, little replacements or just filament printed without uh, um, 
the text on them and for the moment it'll do uh, they're basically made out of two pieces so they print easily uh, the lower half here and then the upper half and then they just you know, line them up and glue them together sometime in the future once again if I ever get a resin printer I'll probably uh, go back and update these so they can have embedded text but beats the heck out of just um, metal stub sticking out trying to find some sort of a um, equivalent oops I got the wrong wrong combo here okay there we go combo there combo here and then uh, you know they, they call it alternate between uh, curved pocket there and more flat pocket clamp pocket flat so far as knowing who's who uh, so I guess kind of notice that little element and so I think we're basically up and running uh, I don't see any other issues I could talk a little bit about the uh, planetary so, and so forth but it's really the mechanism in here but it's uh, it's really tight and buried in there and if you're curious about it you could look at the patents I could go into a little more of the details on this guy but I guess on this guy being such a simple machine I didn't want to go too long on a video on this guy I guess just to note that this machine ran for an amazingly long time and I have another machine uh, a comptometer that also uh, its history is basically or at least generalizing its history has also been run for a long time and I'll bring that one out put the case back on this guy here and uh, just do a little quick comparison between the two machines and, and why would people have chosen one over the other okay so we'll just put this guy back on real quick here um, let's see here so this guy goes on super easy put these two little screws thumb screws back in I could do you know more of a full restoration on this guy as far as the paint job goes and so forth but you know I think it's nice as is as found doesn't really need a lot you know if it was a you know a rusty mess or something like that I, I, I might do a little more cleaning but fundamentally you know it works and I'm pretty darn happy with it so, so I'll, uh, I'll go grab the comptometer and, and sh kind of compare to the two guys that are contemporary to each other okay so here's the burrows let's see which way should I go I guess I could probably go small guy big guy maybe okay maybe I'll go that way that way you kind of fill the frame here you guys get an idea what this is about so comptometer if you're not familiar and, and chances are if you're looking into uh, calculator videos you're probably pretty familiar with the comptometer it uh, was basically the first really practical keyboard driven key entered uh, mechanical calculator started in the late 1880s and this is a model J it was made in probably 1929 1932 and um, the history on this guy is really interesting I bought him also for $20 you can get these for not really a whole lot of money and this one just works and I've, I've, I've had it for a few years and I've kept thinking well I'm gonna do a YouTube video on this guy but it's like well it just works and there's other people that have done better demos on these calculators than I can probably do and so what would I add to uh, talking about a calculator an old calculator just works um, the thing that's probably interesting about this one and also this guy is how long they ran or at least a model like this guy this guy I bought from a, a gal that had retired she was an accountant or uh, a, a CPA accountant I believe and she had an office and this was displayed in her office and when she was going to school uh, presumably college in the uh, early 70s after school each day uh, she um, did inventory counting at uh, some big stores and back then you know electronic calculators were still quite expensive and you know they would have ate up batteries like crazy and all you needed to do was just simply add that's all that's all this uh, was about was just you know adding up inventory so they would put a calculator just like this one I don't know for sure this one ever had that particular life but uh, she had a calculator just like this one and when she saw it at an antique shop she bought it for nostalgia reasons and so late uh, you know early 70s maybe later 70s a mechanical a machine like this is being used for very practical purposes for very practical reasons it's just a mechanical machine it would um, let's see, this one is, there we go okay. um, mechanical device all you need to do is add it's you it can fit on a, a, a shopping cart just fine and you just go up and down the aisles counting up your stuff 
and it didn't need any batteries and maybe the counting company that uh, did the inventory for these various businesses because it sounded like they went from business to business every, every evening you know maybe they had a large stockpile of these guys and they were cheap at the time or maybe they bought these a long time ago and you know they had no reason to, to change their equipment so you know as early or I should say as late as the uh, 70s and maybe even 80s looks like these machines were being used and you know if all you need is addition these are just as fast as an electronic calculator they really are uh, the one thing you got to get used to is the sheer distance of the stroke of the keys and that's the one thing that kind of throws me off a bit is just how long that stroke has to be you kind of get used to that and all you're doing is adding you really can't beat them they really are great Div multiplication isn't too much trouble you know it's the you you take and you uh, do however many times and there's d better like I say uh, demos by um, say BSS 250 uh, or uh, I kind of can't remember his name at the moment I'll put a link they do really good um, uh, YouTube reviews of calculators and in case of BSS 250 a lot of really nice repair work um, so anyways yes back to that so, addition really easy to do multiplication no real big deal um, subtraction starts to get a little painful although it's better for the comptometer than it is for the uh, burrows division is uh, really painful and I think in that case you'd be better off with the contemporary at the time was a model K calculator maybe I'll uh, bring out the uh, Monroe model K here in this uh, diatribe here in a minute if I feel like it to show you how much easier that is but if you're familiar with calculators once again a calculator has a movable carriage then you you can take care of uh, multiplication and division with really not much more trouble once again than a modern electronic calculator so I guess that's kind of basically it uh, as far as you know these guys were made pretty much the same time period why would they have chosen the comptometer over the burrows is kind of the next question that's kind of in my back of my mind and the only thing I can think of is the burrows had to definitely cost less uh, I, I'd have to go look up one of the old um, catalogs to find out maybe I'll I'll do a quick look up on that and post it on this video or we'll put it in the text in the read me show me down below um, but almost certainly this guy was cheaper because it doesn't have the safety features that this guy does that's the nice thing about the comptometer it became a very refined machine to where you really had to do some goofy things to keep the machine from giving you the wrong answer if you push down the key halfway and so forth it would had features where it would intentionally design to lock up to prevent you from typing any further until you hit this uh, little reset button over here which I still got to make a cap for by the way and I guess I got to make a cap for this guy too I should do it just like I did on this guy um, and then it has all these really nice features here for controlling um, the carryovers and so forth that really makes doing the uh, more advanced functions beyond just addition quite palatable at least for a machine that once again doesn't have a moving carriage and so forth whereas this guy doesn't have any of that he doesn't have any safety features he doesn't have any of the control features at all he's cheaper and I think probably the other big compelling thing is it's just smaller you know it takes up a lot less uh, footprint and so if your application I guess in the day 1925 1930 you're saying this case was you only have a limited desk space you only maybe do an addition maybe a bit more um, subtraction division this is definitely the machine to get and um, if you have the desk space I guess what I was saying if you don't have the desk space you don't do much else than just addition and you're you know tight on the budget perhaps then this guy makes a lot of sense you know if you're you know once again just doing mostly addition so I think it's kind of the the choice between the two otherwise mechanically they're largely the same you know the power of the device is simply derived from you pushing the button and uh, otherwise they're remarkably repeatable I think the other thing that's really interesting is because this machine has been refined and is designed constantly refined since uh, 1888 I believe something like that you push these buttons and it is just like really feels good kind of machinery it just has this really nice everything's really, really refined mechanically it's amazing how 
you know, I deal with computer controlled machine tools and CAD and very advanced stuff. And you feel how this works and it just it really feels good. It's a really just from a machine machinery standpoint person, this thing is just feels nice. This guy on the hand, he's kinda grindy, clunky, doesn't definitely doesn't have that feel to it. Just doesn't have that quite satisfying feel. And then if you feel like something that really gives you a uh, satisfying mechanical feel, uh, the Burroughs um, Type 1, Type 6 um, style adding listening machines like I've featured um, you know, quite a few videos ago, that machine gives you a heck of a feeling of mechanical crunch there. It's just really a massive machine and gives you a feel that's just really satisfying. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's basically it. That's kind of my dry tribe here. Um, if you're cheap, get this guy and you need the floor space maybe and you don't do a whole lot more in addition. If you got a, some more money to spend, you can afford a little more desk space and you need to do more advanced features, this guy. And then if you're you know doing a lot more multiplication and subtraction, especially division, you got to really go for a machine with a moving carriage because otherwise this will do these things. If you're skilled at it, you can do it. Oh, I'm glad I did, didn't have to do the use these for a living otherwise for any of those more advanced features. Uh, so anyhow, I think that's it. Kind of, I guess kind of down memory lane here. It's kind of neat. Mid 70s, <laughs> looks like maybe mid 80s for these guys. So I thought that was pretty cool. So anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this quick little video, a little TLC on this guy and just a general diatribe talk and uh, on old machines. And thanks for watching.